This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. He had had a play performed at the Porte Saint-Martin before. He'd been asked to write for them when they, um, they relaunched the theatre in, in 1802. And it's possible that the directors approached him with an offer too good to refuse as they were trying to restore that theatre's fortunes. And Pixelico is a fairly safe bet to pull in an audience at that point. He's at sort of the height of his successes. But the change of theatre also results in some changes to the content of the play, and the manuscript bears witness to that. Pixericourt can increase the size of the troop of soldiers to make the staging more impressive. He also rewrites the dialogue for the peasant characters, making it grammatically less correct, and thereby exploiting the talents of the three main comic actors of the Théâtre La Porte Saint-Martin. So the manuscript provides useful evidence, therefore, of Pixericourt adapting his writing for particular actors. The manuscript also shows how Pixericor takes an original German play, Kotzebue's Hugo Grotius, and adapts it for his own purposes. Kotzebue is one of the leading playwrights in Europe at the time. The year before Pixericor writes La Forteresse du Danube, he had accused Kotzebue of being nothing but a stealer of French plays, which he then goes on to adapt for the German stage. The manuscript shows that initially Pixericor is doing precisely that in reverse, but he systematically reworks the text to move it away from being a translation although we still can see very similar phrases. The set design, uh, if we look at the beginning of, of the act premier, um, is, is pretty much word for word from the, from the Pixericor state, the uh, Kotzebue stage directions. A lot of the textual alterations in the manuscript are attempts to move the dialogue and plot away from being a simple translation of the German. He also rewrites the escape of the protagonist, a political prisoner held in the fortress of the title. Originally, the prisoner and his daughter, who has come to rescue him, dressed up as a young Savoyard boy, disguised as a travelling entertainer. Originally, the prisoner and daughter are simply going to exchange outfits and places. The manuscript includes a line to the effect that the two could easily be taken for each other. Pixericourt abandons the plot device entirely. Is that because in the move between theatres, there's suddenly a considerable difference in height between the lead actress and the actor playing the prisoner? Or is it because the trio of comic actors he now has to work with inspires a much more amusing scene where the one-eyed guardian has his good eye covered over while the prisoner walks straight out of the front door? We don't have any evidence of the height of any of the characters or actors. We've looked in biographies and things to try and find evidence. It's simple speculation at this point to like find some more evidence as to why he abandons one plot entirely, which was his own creation. It wasn't a copy of the Kotzebue, um, but the manuscript shows quite clearly he sort of scrubs that out and, and redesigns it. He also abandons the the plan to finish the play with song, distancing it from the opera comique tradition out of which his concept of melodrama had developed. Other rewritings in the manuscript reflect Pixericourt's concern with keeping on the right side of the authorities. The play was originally set in the Tyrol, but in 1804 it looked as though France would soon be fighting on Austrian soil, so Pixericourt perhaps felt it prudent to move the action to Bavaria. Originally, there was also a subtitle, The Adopted Son, There is still an adopted son in the play, but a lot of the dialogue fleshing out his relationship with the prisoner is cut from the manuscript. In June 1804, just weeks before Pixericourt started on the play, Napoleon had declared Josephine's son from her first marriage, Eugène de Beauharnais, as enfant de notre adoption. Although the formal adoption didn't actually take place until 1806, when Eugène reached the age of 25, that is the age of majority as set out in the Code Civil, Pixericourt perhaps felt it prudent to play down the idea of the adopted son so that analogies between the play and the soon-to-be imperial family were less apparent. Performances of his previous melodrama, Tekeli, had been briefly suspended when ministers in the audience had interpreted lines as suggesting sympathy for a plot against Napoleon's life, so Pixericourt has good reason to be cautious. In a similar vein, Pixericourt systematically removes the word emperor from the manuscript, replacing it either with sovereign or Joseph II, again, I think, to prevent audience or police from equating the representation of the Habsburg emperor in the play with the, by performance, newly crowned Napoleon I. There's no calendar of performances for Paris for the period. Wikipedia has an incomplete list of premieres for some theatres, Wix in the 1950s produced a a bibliography of first performances in alphabetical order, but omits plays he deems to be simple translations of foreign works. So for now, we have to rely on Pixericourt's own figures for performance runs. He claims 281 performances in Paris, 323 in the provinces. Um, And it was performed right the way through the empire. This isn't just a a one-year wonder, but it's something that, that runs right the way through the period. 
Though we do need to be slightly wary of Pixaricot and his um, manipulation of, of, of the truth. He's not averse to manipulating it. Um, in the 1841 Théâtre Choisy, he very kindly reprints reviews of his plays, an extremely useful source of information about reception of the play. But he rewrites the most critical review of the forteresse by the most famous of the Empire critics, Geoffroy, in order to tone down the criticism that Geoffroy uh, places in his review of the comic elements of the play. Geoffroy, by the point to which um, this is, 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 is republished, is long dead, so I think he thinks he's going to get away with it because no one's going to notice the difference. The comic element is one aspect of melodrama that modern critics tend to play down. They focus instead on melodrama as morality plays for the masses. The received view is that Pixar Ecourt said he wrote theatre for those who could not read. In fact, that expression is put into his mouth by a satirist in 1809 mocking the genre, but has for the last 200 years simply been taken as fact. La Forteresse du Danube does contain a sympathetic representation of the lower classes, but the dim, sympathetic peasant character is not unique to melodrama by any means. The play belongs to a long-standing sentimental tradition of depicting the conflict between love and duty, as the adopted son Olivier wrestles with the moral dilemma of betraying either his adopted father Evrard or his friend the commander of the garrison. The plot is resolved through the emperor realising he's been tricked by his courtiers and reinstating the political prisoner Evrard at court. The privileging of the paternal is reinforced by the play's music. The original score by Italian opera composer Bianchi hasn't survived, but the new music for the, um, the Reprise in 1810 has survived <coughs> in, in manuscript form, and so has an as yet undated score in Lille by a composer called Marti. Both of these surviving scores have music cues which emphasise the paternal in the play. The embrace scenes between father figure and son are doubled and take place to music, which thereby draws out, emphasises and emotionalises the father-son relations. This is not so much entertainment for the masses as Pixar Ecourt working through the trauma of the revolution and suggesting that Napoleon's paternalistic new empire might enable the restoration of social bonds. I'm going to pause my analysis of La Forteresse du Danube for a moment just to sketch out the development of melodrama in the years leading up to its success in order to contextualise this assertion that Pixar Ecourt is working through the trauma of the revolution. In 1798, the year Pixar Ecourt has his first melodramatic successes, the French were in the grip of a Gothic mode and only seemed to want to read novels or watch plays about the abuse of power, familial secrets, questions of inheritance and legitimacy, themes that were of very real concern in the post-Thermidorian context. The most successful novelist of the period was Ducré Duminil, whose Victor ou l'enfant de la forêt would be the source of Pixar Ecourt's first major stage success. It's a novel that deals with the Thermidorian response to the violence of the revolution. A quick plug for the book, Narrative Responses of the Trauma of the Revolution, if you have not yet read it. Uh, sensibility had become problematised and politicised during the terror, and its reappearance in fiction post-Thermidor provided a space for shared trauma and a new imagined community. In psychoanalytic terms, La Planche and Pantalis define trauma as an événement de la vie du sujet qui se définit par son intensité, l'incapacité où se trouve le sujet d'y répondre adéquatement, le bouleversement et les effets pathogènes durables qu'il provoque dans l'organisation psychique. The integrity of the self is thereby called into question, and the subject resorts to the compulsive repetition of the traumatic situation. The cause is often part of the symptom in that recurring nightmares or reworkings of the traumatic event trouble the subject and inhibit their ability to relieve their suffering. This acting out is often not verbal, but gestural or physical. And the way to recovery is to be in a position to remember consciously and verbalise the traumatic event, to understand the relation between event and symptom, and to recognise that the threat is now over. The French Revolution, and more specifically the period of the terror, can be seen as providing an emotive shock linked to a situation where the subject has felt his life to be in danger. And that's certainly the case with Ducré du Minil, who was briefly um, imprisoned under the terror, only to be saved, in inverted commas, by the, the Knights of Thermidor. The terror can also be seen as a collective traumatic event affecting an entire community. For Kai Erickson, collective trauma is, and I quote, a blow to the basic tissues of social life that damages the bonds attaching people together and impairs the prevailing sense of communality. Collective trauma works its way slowly and even insidiously into the awareness of those who suffer from it, so it does not have the quality of suddenness normally associated with trauma. 
but it is a form of shock all the same, a gradual realisation that the community no longer exists as an effective source of support and that an important part of the self has disappeared. The sense of trauma affecting a community and not just an individual can usefully be adapted to the French Revolution when there was a collective sense that the world had been turned upside down and that previous certainties about family and the structure of society seemed no longer to apply. Trauma theory allows us to re-examine the apparently non-political as a response to the upheaval of the revolution, since those who have been subject to a traumatic experience are affected by the impact of its incomprehensibility. It also allows us to look for tensions in the sentimental, in sentimental genre, for displacement or disguise, for traces of the effect of the revolution, rather than the direct representation of historical reality. I've already shown how in the novel of the revolutionary decade, trauma is reflected, but given that, as Suzette Henker reminds us, it is through the very process of rehearsing and reenacting a drama of mental survival that the trauma narrative effects psychological catharsis, it seems to me useful to extend the exploration of trauma to the theatre of the period, given the centrality of notions of acting out the non-verbal and the gestural in trauma studies. Pixericourt was briefly an émigré. He left France on his father's instruction and headed to Koblenz in, in September 1791, but returned with the Duc d'Anguien's permission, permis, permission in October 1792 and spent the winter of 1792-93 in Paris, therefore at the time of the trial of the king and his execution. Retrospectively, Pixaricourt will talk of the emotional effect of watching the tumbrils roll along to the guillotine on a daily basis, resulting in a mental state where, he says, toutes uh, mes idées étaient empreintes du noir le plus foncé. But he is possibly conflating this stay in Paris with his second. Between January 1793 and February 94, he was in Nancy. But when an arrest warrant is issued against him, he returns to Paris, where he persuaded Carnot to requisition him as useful to the Republic. And he served as secretary to Carnot and had his name removed from the list of émigrés in 1795. So we have plenty of personal biographical elements here which we could use to explore the notion that Pixericourt is reworking the upheaval of the revolution in his theatre. But I think we can also see his plays as reflecting more generally a collective response too. The first three plays he succeeds in having staged in Paris, two adaptations from the leading exponent of the English Gothic, Anne Radcliffe, and one from Ducré du Minil, share not simply close thematic links, but what Cathy Carruth has labelled insistently recurring words or figures, um, as a sort of an, an evidence of trauma. And that insistent recurring image is the figure of the bandit. So I want to explore the way in which we might see them as working through of the radical phase of the revolution. Critics have long recognised the link in Ducré du Minil's novel Victor, between what Jean Gillet called the terror of the narrative, la terreur du récit, and the terror of history, la terreur de l'histoire, despite its 17th century setting. Michael Tilby has shown how the bandit leader Roger is in part a representation of Robespierre, and I've demonstrated how the plot allows the committed Republican Ducré to come to terms with the terror. The Gothic becomes a way for writers to explore the tensions and contradictions inherent in the revolution, and for recasting the Jacobins as villains under the directory. Pixericourt extends this by writing not one, but three bandit plays within a year, all performed within seven months of each other. We have um, La Forêt de Sicile, based on Ad Radcliffe, April 1790, performed in April 1798. Victor, l'enfant de la forêt, June 1798. And Le Château des Apennins, again based on Radcliffe, um, in December 1798. Two further plays also exploit the bandit figure, L'Homme à Trois Visages in October 1801 and La Femme à Deux Marie, September 1802. The focus of these early melodramas on the ambiguous figure of the bandit allows Pixericourt to exploit what Babillet in the Journal d'Indication calls l'emploi du terrible et du pathétique et l'art de produire des effets. But in rejecting the lawlessness of the bandit and his band, and in reinforcing instead the reunion of families, Pixaricourt seems to, to hark back to the structured certainties of the Ancien Régime, at the same time as pointing forward to a revised understanding of the father figure. After this series of bandit plays, Pixaricourt moves on to plays which focus on the restoration of the father or the reinforcement of the father-child relationship. Um, so, uh, Colline ou l'enfant du mystère, September 1800, Le Pèlerin Blanc ou les orphelins du Hameau, April 1801, uh, to which we might then attach uh, La Forteresse du Danube in, in 1804 5. 
We might at this point bring Lynn Hunt's family romance in as a complement to the trauma theory. Hunt has shown how the Thermidorian and Directory regimes wanted to institute a pro-family regime without the element of patriarchalism they had opposed in Ancien Regime arrangements. And in fiction and theatre, this translated into a focus on orphans who are independent but ultimately reconciled with good fathers by the end of the text. By the Napoleonic period, Hunt says, the reformulation of the family romance had dissolved the anxieties inherent in making one's own way in the world and replaced them with paternalistic values instead. Pixar Ricoeur's plays demonstrate very neatly this trend. His characters are not submissive to an authoritarian father figure, but prepared to make their own moral decisions before being rewarded with reconciliation with a good father, who thereby expiates the death of the king. The texts of the plays show how the recovery and rehabilitation of the father represents an evolution from the sentimental tradition of the 1780s. I want to, to explore um, now is how the sense of sound might be used and the use of music in the plays might be used to privilege certain emotions and highlight themes, because obviously the text is just one element of a performance of melodrama. Music is one of its key distinguishing features. Often the music is just a few bars in length. There might be 15 or 20 snatches of music per act in a, in a melodrama. Um, there would be more extended music um, for the obligatory dance number, but often the pieces of music are very short. Um, so um, the music from the scores of melodramas were not usually published in the way that uh, music for opera comique might be published, because you haven't got the set pieces of music, you've got snatches rather than sort of fully formed pieces. Modern scholarship on the relationship between music and trauma highlights the fact that, and I quote Michael Swallow, to most people music is felt and expressed as an emotion. As Julie Sutton remarks, music is felt physically and as emotion in the body, and as such it can be a powerful resource for finding a form with which to begin to adjust to extreme experiences. Not only does music create an emotional response in the auditor, but it can also renew contact with the past and so encourage a return to a space of safety required for the process of assimilating the traumatic event to begin. Now, I'm not suggesting that we can recreate the emotions felt at the time, but I think that we can look at the text and the score together, alongside contemporary reviews and other source material, to think about the way in which, uh, or which feelings and emotions are being valorised through the use of music in early 19th century melodrama. The curative powers of music were recognised at the time. In 1803, there are no less than three publications in France outlining the medicinal benefits of music. Etienne Sainte-Marie, who translated uh, Joseph-Louis Roger's Traité des effets de la musique sur le corps humain, adds a substantial preface where he reflects on music's healing qualities. La musique répare les pertes de l'esprit et du corps produites par des contentions profondes. La musique peut rendre à l'âme ce qu'elle a perdu, he continues. Après avoir entendu de la musique, nous apercevons mieux le vrai rapport des choses. So examining where uh, Pixar Ricourt uh, chooses to privilege music in his early melodrama allows us to consider the link between the notion of trauma and performing emotion through music. And traditionally, the analysis of music in melodrama has been reduced to a few generalizations repeated from one scholar to the next despite Emilio Sala pointing out that only if music is reintegrated can we understand the dynamics of the genre. In what remains one of the most extensive explorations of melodrama music, Paul Ginisti devoted just four pages out of 224 to music in his monograph on melodrama. He concluded that music was used primarily to mark entrances and exits, with particular instruments linked to certain character types, so the flute represented the unhappy heroine, for instance. Uh, but he also talked about the way in which music was used to underline moments of drama and emotion. Emilio Sala's examination of music in melodrama extended the list of the uses of music to include giving voice to the body and depth to dialogue. But I would suggest that we can also add revealing emotional processes, structuring stage action and narrating some offstage action to that list of the way in which music is used. The introduction of music in the play offers an additional layer of meaning for the audience. But the fact that the manuscript scores are not very accessible means that very little really has been done to compare score and text and therefore explore the role of the auditory in our understanding of melodrama. 
Unfortunately, the scores for the early bandit plays of the directory period haven't survived, but we do have scores for some of the early 19th century father plays in inverted commas. In La Femme à deux Marie, the musical cues stress above all the family relationships between the female protagonist and her son and um, her and her estranged father. So the music is very firmly concentrating the audience's mind on the notion of reconciliation. The musical cue for the embrace between the protagonist Eliza and her son is then reused by the same composer for a father-son reunion in Act One of Pixaricor's later Robinson Crusoe, performed in 1805. Here the father-son reunion is between uh, Vendredi and his long-lost father. Um, so again, that, that brings the whole notion of intertextuality to melodrama in that the audiences might recognise the sort of the, um, the snatch of music but it's also, again, music being used to highlight the significance of the idea of the reunion of the family. But I'm going to come back to that Forteresse du Danube. This is the first melodrama performed under the Empire in, in January 1805. And as part of um, our AHRC-funded project, last year, March 2014, my postdoc, Catherine Hambridge, and colleagues from an ERC-funded project on music in 19th century London at KCL, ran a conference on melodrama to which we added a performance research workshop with actors and musicians so that we could explore more fully the relationship between music and text. And the workshop allowed us to further our understanding how text, gesture and music are intertwined. So we looked at the first act of La Forteresse, alongside its English translation come adaptation. The texts are very close. If you actually put the English and the French alongside, um, although the English version shortens the dialogue, the, it is in essence the same play. But the music written for each is very different. So the workshop allowed us to explore national differences in the development of melodrama. That lies beyond the scope of this paper. A video documentary should be out sooner rather than later on that, so watch this space. Told you, it's just one long plug here. All I do is <laughs> plug work I'm doing. Um, let me just give you a quick summary of the, the, the plot of La Forteresse du Danube. Evrard is a political prisoner, locked up in the fortress of the title with his servant, Alix. He's been deprived of news of his daughter, Celestine, for two months. She's been trying to intercede with the emperor to have her father released. But when she sends a note to say all hope is lost, Alix persuades Olivier to help his adoptive father, Evrard, escape instead. But just after Olivier agrees to help, the commander leaves him in charge of the garrison and warns that both their heads, that is to say Olivier and the commanders, will roll if anything happens to the prisoner while the commander is away. So this commander figure, Val Braun, is then represented as a further surrogate father figure for Olivier. So we've got sort of a doubling of the father figure in the prisoner and the, and the commander. In the performance workshop, the centrality of the role of Olivier, the adopted son, became clear. He may not say as much as some of the other characters, but his importance is heavily underscored by the mime to music he's required to perform at key moments of moral and emotional dilemma in the first act. This requires some tricky and unnatural miming of emotional experience to music, something that modern actors trained in naturalism are entirely unfamiliar with. Sometimes, particularly in the scene where Olivier is reading a letter from the daughter and deciding to betray his duty in order to help his adopted father, the music gave useful cues as to the timing of the emotional processes. But the score was often more ambiguous and more demanding. The final monologue of the act in the French original was succeeded by music that seemed to express the moral dilemma facing Olivier and required gestural externalisation of the emotions just expressed in the spoken text. But significantly, and this is what I want to, to dwell on here, the music draws out, emphasises and emotionalises the embrace scenes of the father-son relations, just as it had privileged these moments in other father melodramas. So I've got some clips for you to look at the way in which music is, is working in this sort of father-son pairing. We spent quite a lot of time in the workshop trying to sort of play with how these scenes might actually work. The point in the play I'm about to show you, Evra thinks he's seeing his adopted son, Olivier, for the last time. The embrace, therefore, is meant to sum up their entire relationship. Now, the English adaptation does not have a musical cue at this point, so I'm just going to fail to find the end. I want to end my PowerPoint. Wait a second. Um, so, the English scene of their sort of farewell does not have music. So I'm just going to play you that to start with so that you can compare 
the English version then with the French version that has music. And if you just bear with me while I find the next the next moment, the the French um, moment, the equivalent of that of that scene. If I just find the right three minutes, ten seconds. Okay, that was our first attempt um, at the, the French scene. Um, the orchestra at that point is playing in the same tempo as for the other music cues elsewhere in, in, in the act. Now, whilst it's not on effect, ineffective, um, I think you can see a difference already from the English version that has no music to, to putting the music in, um, we experimented with what happened if we slowed the music down and made the embrace longer. Um, and the difference in emotional impact was immediately clear to all of those in the audience. So let me just find the scene as we finally decided to play it, um, slowed down for the, for the full emotional impact. So hopefully you can see um, the way in which the, just the changing the tempo of the of the music allowed us really to um, to play much more with the way in which the the emotional impact of that scene was actually working. But this isn't the only father son embrace in this first act. So the commander Valgrin takes his leave of Olivier shortly after Evrard has left. So Val Brown is presented as Olivier's friend, but someone who shows a paternal interest in his well-being. He's just left Olivier in charge of the fortress and therefore the safekeeping of the prisoner. Val Brown's head will roll if anything happens to the prisoner, but Olivier has just organised Evra's escape, and so he finds himself in this position where duty and love are in conflict. So in rehearsals, we explored emphasising the symmetry between the two relationships, and I just want to show you... Um, one final, one final musical in, interlude, show you that that this parallel father son scene. So the emphasis that the music, not just in the score we were using, we're using the score from the Lille 
um, production. Um, but the score for the reprise that's held at, at um, Avignon has music scored at both of these points as well. Um, there's a sort of a, a, there are parallels between the different scores as to where they choose to put the music. So the emphasis that the music is putting on the father-son relationship allows us to see the play as part of a broader post-revolutionary process of working through the trauma of the revolution. And the use of music to highlight these moments reinforces what Jens Hesselager has referred to as the audio-visual nature of the tableau, because although there are pauses in the action, they're most definitely not static because of the way in which music and gesture combine to create powerful effect. Re-examining the way in which the emotions are engaged in Picard's play through the use of music cues allows us to explore the ways in which French melodrama represents a stage in the process of coming to terms with the deep divisions in French society that the events of the revolution created. And Pixericor's refashioning of the father-son relations in particular and their privileging through musical cues can be seen as a way of offering, as offering a way of experiencing the revolution but at the same time connecting to the new. Now this experiment in participatory research is obviously not a recreation of the original performance, but it allowed us to think a little bit more uh, clearly about the contrast in use of music between the French and the English versions with regard specifically to these father-son moments, um, and the difference is, is really quite striking. Um, participatory research of this nature allows us to go beyond the text. But as with the study of the manuscript, it throws up a host of questions about representativity. Do melodramas by other playwrights exhibit the same link of emotion and music? Is there a change over time? What about other genres? Or is there something in melodrama that makes it particularly susceptible to such readings? Much more extensive research is needed into the scores, not just of Pixar Records plays, but his colleagues, contemporaries and rivals. Similarly, although the manuscript of the Forteresse gives us clues to Pixar Records' process of creating drama, it's just one play. Now, the work of analysing manuscripts is a slow and painful one, and how do you begin to go about treating the other melodramas of the Empire period with the same attention to detail? To produce a critical edition of the Forteresse took me about nine months worth of, 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 of work. There are 295 melodramas listed in Wix for the Napoleonic period. That takes me quite a long way beyond my three-year AHRC grant. Um, without a calendar of performances, it's hard to establish which plays are the most successful. But without contextualisation, it's hard to establish just why and how the boulevard theatres became to be seen as sufficiently subversive for Napoleon to attempt to control them by policing genre in the theatre decrees of 1806 and 1807. So there's some very real practical methodological problems simply with the size of the corpus and the, the, the almost entire neglect of, of the corpus of the, of the first 15 years of the 19th century makes it very hard to actually go in and do work without knowing what you need to be looking at, but how do you work out what you need to look at without spending years actually looking at, at the, the corpus in detail. So, to sidestep the methodological issues and to gain a sense of the differences between the beginning and end of the regime, I've been looking at the reappearance of Pixarico melodrama at the end of the empire, led um, in that direction in part by the approaching bicentenary of the 100 days. So by 1814, melodrama had become very firmly politicised and used by Louis XVIII's supporters as a way of denigrating Napoleon. I'm going to do a quick, ooh, a quick swap back to my PowerPoint. Let's take it from there. Okay. Abdi, in his treatise, Plus de Melodrame, published during the First Restoration in 1814, talks, or Ment says, that as the people of France have now ousted Napoleon, it was time to oust melodrama too. A print from 18, July 1840 also politicises melodrama and explicitly links the emperor with the empire's most successful theatrical form. In the print, Napoleon is depicted as Robinson Crusoe. He's wearing a lion skin, holding an umbrella, which bears a golden imperial eagle on the top. Now, the image is a direct reworking of an earlier print of the lead actor in the 1805 melodrama by Pixaricourt, Robinson Crusoe, obviously based on Defoe's novel. The first appearance of the character on the stage at the Théâtre de la Porte Saint-Martin had caused a sensation in 1805, but the echoing of that performance in the political satire is perhaps more surprising. The use of a theatrical reference point, that of a melodrama from nine years before, is a reminder of how closely entwined culture and politics were during the First Empire. 
Robinson Crusoe had swept Paris by storm when it premiered. Contemporary accounts mention how discussion about the play had filled the press for weeks before the first performance. The opening night was a huge success for Pixericor, who was at the time the leading French playwright. That a satirical political print in 1814 might make reference to a melodrama from almost a decade earlier might seem surprising. But it does reveal the extent to which successful melodramas infiltrated public consciousness, and it reinforces a recurrent discourse amongst Restoration critics linking the genre to the Napoleonic regime. The print is said to have been inspired by a conte published in the Jour Journal du Gers, attributing the following lines to Napoleon. Avouez tous que j'ai fini mon rôle d'une manière assez plate, assez drôle. Nevertheless, the image of Napoleon as Robinson Crusoe does not portray him as melodrama villain, and there were no shortage of those, but as the hero of one of the most successful plays of the period. So the print's satirical intent is somewhat undercut by the choice of, of, of character. The possibility of reading the print either as negative or nostalgic representation of the former emperor is extended when the caption to the original print is considered. Um, the PowerPoint You'd have to have very good eyesight to be able to read the caption at the bottom of that print. I will read it for you. Um, the 1805 print of the play includes a line from early on in the melodrama, and it was customary at the time for prints of actors representing characters to include a line of text so that the print represents a particular moment in the performance. The caption here reads, « Relève-toi, ce n'est que devant Dieu que l'homme doit s'humilier. » Now, the line is not without ambiguity when it's placed alongside the Napoleonic image of, of Napoleon as Robinson. So in the context of May 1814, when the, um, the Robinson print is, 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 is made, the caption recalled by the similarities between the two prints can either be a suggestion of newfound humility, as it was for the character in the Pixericourt play, or an indication of Napoleon's overinflated sense of his own importance. So the print can bear opposite meanings, um, which is a technique often used by printmakers to increase potential sales, because then it allows you to, to capture both markets, as it were. There's a long tradition in British prints of linking Napoleon to the theatrical. So in this print from 1803, about the projected invasion of Britain, and this Cruikshank uh, print from 1804, both portray Bonaparte as a harlequin figure. French printmakers then appropriate the theatrical towards the end of the empire. You may be familiar with, with this print, which is a very, very well-known one of Napoleon receiving lessons in deportment from Talma, the leading actor of his day. But there's a particularly evident turn to the theatrical um, after the end of the, the empire. As here, showing Napoleon on Elba, again as a harlequin. So we've moved from British prints using the harlequin figure now to sort of post um, abdi first abdication um, to, to the French printmakers using the harlequin figure. In this print, each section, each sort of diamond of the harlequin suit bears one of the various titles that Napoleon had had during his career, from General de l'Armée d'Egypte to Bourgeois de l'Île d'Elbe. So it sort of gives the, sort of the full run of his, his career to that point. To me, the print is an interesting one to, to pair with the Robinson uh, de Lille d'Elbe portrayal, since they both mock Napoleon, but retain a certain sympathy for him too. The representation of Napoleon as Philoctetes um, is another example of this slightly ambiguous, um, both um, mocking, but also re revealing a certain sympathy for the for the for the sort of the, the former emperor, um, is another example of this sort of broader trend of Napoleon on Elba as theatrical character. And I'm going to use this print as yet another quick plug. Um, this time. <laughs> For an exhibition that we're doing at Warwick, we're in the final process of putting together an exhibition on the 100 days. And that print um, of, of, of Philoctet is, is one of the day's entries. So this is just to say, um, from the 23rd of February, we will be um, publishing an image a day to take us right the way through the 100 days period. Um, so, so watch out for that. And if you have nothing better to do on the 6th of March, then we will be doing a lecture concert at the British Museum to go alongside their Bonaparte and the British Prince exhibition. 
um, so that you can find out a little bit more about Theatre and Napoleon and the way in which it links to, to popular folk ballads um, in Britain and in Germany as well. I think that might be the last plug of the evening. <laughs> When Napoleon escapes from Elba and restores the empire in the spring of 1815, given this um, predilection for theatrical prints and the linking of, of the emperor and theatre, it's perhaps not entirely surprising that parallels are then established between him and theatrical characters in terms of what is staged during the Hundred Days. The opera and the Comédie Française make unequivocal gestures in their choice of repertoire. The opera brings back Le Triomphe de Trajan, uh, an opera first performed at the height of the empire in 1807. It's thinly veiled propaganda. Music from the coronation is incorporated into the triumphal march and the depiction of Trajan is set up very deliberately to present the audience with the equivalent of Napoleon in a toga. Similarly, the Comédie Française performs two plays um, in particular where the parallels with Napoleon make them pièces de circonstance, even though they predate the return of the emperor. The first, Marius and Mantourne, is a revolutionary play from 1791 by Antoine Vincent Arnoux, pulled from the depths of obscurity because of its analogies with current affairs. The journal uh, Le Nain Jaune commented, Les destinées miraculeuses du héros de l'île d'Elbe et celles du fugitif de Mantourne, surtout telles que Monsieur Arnaud les a mises en scène, offrent plusieurs rapprochements d'une vérité frappante. The audience was said to have particularly appreciated the following lines. Tu dois tout espérer, puisque ton nom te reste, le seul nom d'un héros, enfant des soldats, te les verra en foule à courir sur tes pas. The connections between Napoleon and Hector performed in front of him in April 1815 are similarly seized upon by audience and journal, journalists alike. The Journal de l'Empire commented on the performance of Hector. Il est peu d'ouvrage qui, dans les conjonctures graves où nous nous trouvons, donne lieu à des allusions plus naturelles et à des applications plus faciles. Aussi, toutes celles qui sont présentées ont-elles été saisies. Whilst the choice of plays at the Opéra and the Comédie Française is clearly and very deliberately political, the popular theatres at first glance do not seem to be as overtly um, offering messages that might be attached to current events. However, the scheduling of performances does throw up some intriguing um, ideas. Although the repertoire at the Porte Saint-Martin is for the vast majority made up of new melodrama, the choice of players accompanying piece each night, as well as the themes of the main melodramas, privilege the idea of the returning soldier, as well as the idea of the willingness of sacrificing everything to defend the returning hero. In March, the Gaiety, um, so that's one, there are three main boulevard theatres, the Porte Saint-Martin, the Gaiety and the Ambigu Comique in, in 1815. So the Gaiety, second of the boulevard theatres, returns to performing Pixaric War in March as Napoleon re reappears in Paris and then premieres a melodrama about Bellissaire, presented as the greatest general of the century. Uh, it seems hard to think that the audience could have done anything other than seen parallels with Napoleon's return to power. At the Ambigu Comique, so there's a third of the boulevard theatres, the stage is filled with Bellicot's new melodramas alongside Pixericourt's earliest melodramas. And nowhere else, apart from the Ambigu Comique, do we have plays from as long ago as the Consulate. Um, the vast majority of plays performed across the Parisian theatres in, during the Hundred Days are from 1812 onwards. So, as you would expect, the vast majority of the theatre of the time is actually you know, recent plays. But there's a dramatic congregation of Pixericourt early plays, which uh, intrigues me. Early Pixericourt was an, an occasional treat at the Ambigu during the First Restoration. So, you, you know, every other Sunday you might get an old Pixericourt play back on. Um, but during the Hundred Days, we suddenly get this sort of thrown onto the onto the the the, the performance calendar, uh, Colina from 1800, L'Homme à Trois Visages, Le Pèlerin Blanc, both 1801, La Femme à Deux Maris, Tekeli, and Les Mines de Pologne from 1803. There's even a rerun of La Forêt Périeuse by Loisel de Tréogat, which dates from 1800. So brigands are on the stage several times a week at the Ambigu during the Hundred Days. Now I need to do plenty more digging before I can make full sense of this. 
But I did promise that I would bring early melodrama together with the 100 days by the end of the talk, and that's what I'm going to try and do. We know that during the 100 days, Napoleon returned to his revolutionary and republican credentials, as this Dutch anti-Napoleonic uh, print makes clear. Um, so this is the, the Jacobins um, sort of re-robing Napoleon. Another one of our items in our 100 days exhibition. I lied. I said I was going to not do any more plugs, didn't I? I've done it again. Um, so Napoleon returns to his republican credentials as a way of trying to sort of present himself as something that Louis XVIII wasn't. So is the scheduling at the ambigu gesturing towards this in its choice of early melodrama from the directory period? Um, the Journal de Paris certainly talks about the Hundred Days as a period which is reminiscent of the vocabulary used during the revolution about how the muses have flown the scene and, and how we're in a state of turmoil. So there's a lot of revolutionary vocabulary going on in, in the Hundred Days in, in, in both sort of theatre reviews and, and actually on the stage. Or do we see this proliferation of early Pixaré court plays by which by the end of June are on almost every night in alternation with the Loisel bandit play? Is this proliferation more a mark of the instability and the uncertainty, uh, trauma in inverted commas, caused by regime change? Does that make Napoleon the villain of the piece after all? Now, I'm not sure I've worked out the implications uh, sufficiently to be able to answer the question I've just posed, and I'd be very interested in your responses to that. But for now, I'm just going to say that, um, draw things to a close by saying that at every turn, when we dig down and uncover far enough what lays, lies beneath the accrued layers of assumptions about Napoleonic theatre, every time we get just a number of surprises. Thank you.